Good morning. Thank you, Dwight, for improvising why Audrey and I hurried around to look for the second step. <laughs> We're trying not to share space this morning, and we only had one step, so that's what happens when you schedule two short people on the same morning. Not really our fault, right? Well, I'd like to welcome you this morning and ask if there are any announcements you'd like to share. There's a microphone here for you. Wednesday is fellowship meal here, 6 o'clock. Um, Paulette and I are cooking. Um, just bring yourselves and come and visit one another and be in a different space than Sunday morning. Oh, yeah, and Sam and Dieta are going to speak, I think, still, yeah, about their trip to Iceland. So they, I don't know if they have pictures or what, but come and, come and see and hear. The church board has agreed to offer some scholarships for the CDS training in October. So if you're applying for the training or you'd like to apply for the training but are lacking $55, there are forms on the bulletin board called scholarship application you can fill out. We have, the, <clears throat> we have the ice cream social today at the park at 4 p.m. Um, is Jan going to come and play? Okay. So um, there's going to be plenty of ice cream, so make sure you come out. I think we said Tuesday, right? No, Monday. Monday morning, Monday morning, 8 o'clock, garden efforts will continue, harvesting, and probably some weeding. So you're welcome to join us as you're able. Okay, if there are no further announcements, let's prepare for worship this morning. In our scripture this morning, we're reminded how Jesus instructs us to find rest when we're weary. Do you remember, as children, the bedtime prayer we were taught? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray, my, pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then our exhausted little bodies just went to sleep. It just worked that way. But as we get older, rest is harder to come by. We have to seek rest, both temporarily and eternally. As adults, when we lay ourselves down to sleep, our minds continue to work. And we must make a conscious effort to give it to God if we're ever going to get any rest. I'd like to invite you this morning to do just that. Let's take a moment in silent prayer to give our burdens to the Lord and seek rest this morning. I'm not asking you by any means to sleep through church. Just lay down your burdens and receive his peace so your morning will be meaningful and the peace will go with you out into the world. Let's each pause now and pray silently for release of these burdens. Lord, you've heard our prayers, and we seek rest and peace in you. Let our bodies relax and our minds receive the peace of this morning's service, that we may take it into the world and spread this good feeling wherever we may go. Amen. Let's open with a praise hymn this morning, Open My Eyes That I May See, 517. of truth. 
Another way that we find peace is by sharing with one another and praying for one another. I'd like to open the floor to concerns that you may have this morning and would like for us to pray for. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> so James 1 reminds us that every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. I invite you to give any financial gifts if you have not already done so, and then we'll dedicate those gifts. Lord, we freely return what you have given us for use near and far as you see fit. We dedicate these gifts in your name. Amen. Let's do children's time now, shall we? Daddy's new hunting buddy, it says on your shirt, huh? Wow. So, um, what have I got in my pocket here? Look at that. What is it? Want another one? Two or three? $20 bills. Look at that. Money. You don't seem too excited. Why aren't you too excited, Sarah? It's not real money, is it? That's just fake money. It's got Andrew Jackson on there and it says $20, but I don't think it would fool too many people, would you? Do you? It's not the right size. It's not the right color. What, what does it have on the back? Nothing. That's just fake money. Okay, so let's try that again. So what about that? Would you like that? If I gave that to you? Does that look real? Yeah. Now, can you believe that some people try to print money like this that looks real so that they can use it? It's called counterfeit money. So you get some paper that's the right color, and you get the right size, and you print on the front, and you print on the back, and does that make it real? It's still not real, is it? You can try it, but, but it doesn't. If people know, they can tell it's not real, even if it looks like it's real on the front and the back. So if you take a real $20 bill, now if you look at it like this, I'm going to use Sarah here, you don't see a line here, do you? But if you hold it up to the light, so adults in the audience, you can try this if you want, you can pull out a $20 bill, and if you hold it up to the light, you can see there's a line in that $20 bill going from there to there. Can you, can you see it? You see, if you... Hold it up to the light. Can you see the line that's there? And you can see it from the back, too. And if you look real closely, it's a small printing, and it says $20. And with a $5 bill, if you do that, you don't see, well, there's some fives there in the corner, right? But in here, you don't see any fives. But if you hold it up to the light, you'll see there's a bunch of fives in there that's inside the paper. So what I'm saying is, if you try to counterfeit money, it doesn't work because the paper itself is not the right paper. So where am I going with this? There's the outside and there's the inside. And a lot of times we just look on the outside but there's a verse in the Bible, there's some verses in the Bible, it's from the Old Testament, and it's a story 
about um, the prophet Samuel finding uh, David, who eventually is going to become king. And first he looks at David's brothers, and he says, oh, man, these guys look really fine. They must be the chosen ones. But he's looking on the outside, and God says, don't look on the outside. God looks on the heart. So you can think about that with money, too. There's the outside, and then when you hold it up on the light, you see inside. And what's inside of us is really important. Okay? So what should I do with this? Okay. God, help us to not just look on the outside of people and help us not to just present a good outside ourselves, but to really work on what's inside ourselves. Amen. I love that I saw a couple people holding money up to the light out in the congregation. That was cute. You're never too old for children's story. Our next hymn this morning is 345, God Sent His Son. Hear the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are exhausted and weighted down beneath your burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As a carpenter by trade, Jesus likely crafted many yokes, or at least observed his father Joseph doing so. The way to make a yoke easy was to get the most perfect fit possible for the oxen, measuring and trimming and shaping the wooden yoke specifically to fit the exact oxen who would be carrying it. So it curved to their bodies and was easier to carry. It makes sense then that God, who knows each and every one of us, would send Jesus to help carry our burdens, knowing exactly what each of us needs to ease our load. Yokes in biblical times were also associated with wisdom because the purpose was to allow experienced oxen to guide young oxen through the exercise of carrying a load. The young oxen did not have to learn to carry its burden alone. Through being yoked, it grew wiser and stronger. 
Jesus, then, is our experienced guide, hearing the other side, sharing the wisdom of God as he helps to shoulder our burdens. While we're on the subject of oxen, I was reminded during my sermon preparation this week about the 10 ox herding pictures associated with the Zen Buddhist path to enlightenment. We studied them in one of my Theopoetics courses in seminary, and I want to share them with you as part of my sermon this morning. If you haven't heard of these, they are pictures of a young ox herder on a journey of spiritual discovery. Harry, if you could click the next slide. So this is the first of these pictures. And in this picture, the ox herder is searching for something. Something that he feels is missing from his life, although he may not even know what it is. This could be inner peace or guidance toward the right job or the right relationships. Translated to English, the caption that accompanies this picture reads, High mountains, deep waters, and a dense jungle of grass. However much you try, the way to proceed remains unclear. To alleviate this sense of frustration, listen to the chirping of cicadas. The author of several of the books that I used at National Youth Conference and poetry and artist, Jan Richardson, once wrote, Jesus knows that if we haven't recognized the poverty within our own souls and how he dwells there, it's hard to see him and serve him in others without being patronizing. So it's very important to be aware of and acknowledge the burdens we are experiencing in order to seek guidance on how to carry them. At National Youth Conference, I was in charge of the preparation for the anointing service which they always hold on the last evening of the conference. Beforehand, the worship team had prepared a scrap of cloth for each participant. And Terry, you could go to the next slide. The purpose of having scraps specifically was that there were many different colors and patterns, some frayed and rough around the edges, the leftover, the left behind, the forgotten, the imperfect, but held in the hands of all who were gathered there. If you're a crafter or you do a lot of art projects, you may have scraps of your own in a room left over from past projects, or you might have some type of cloth, a towel or a blanket you've had for many, many years, or as long as you can remember, that's beginning to fade or fall apart. So you can imagine these scraps of cloth. And I asked them to think of the cloths as symbols for themselves, tired, worn out, feeling frayed at the edges of our emotions, every day facing our imperfections, finding ways to face one another's imperfections with grace. I asked them to look closely at their scraps of cloth and anywhere they saw strings hanging off, to think about where their own lives felt like they might be unraveling where they saw creases and folds in the fabric to think about, where they might be bending over backwards to please others while neglecting their own well-being, if the fabric had rips or tears to consider their own insecurities that could tear them apart from the inside, the areas in life they wished they were better or stronger, looked different, felt happier, think about all their lost or broken relationships with other people, and to make their scraps symbols for all the scraps of themselves. Every crease, every tear, every wrinkle, another broken part of their lives. And then to remember that Jesus is among the scraps, healer of all brokenness. In preparation for the service of anointing and healing that we shared that evening, I had them picture that scrap of cloth as every piece of brokenness, every negative emotion they were holding on to, and to squeeze it as tightly as they could in their hands. And then to let it go. To release their brokenness to God and to trust in the movement of God in our midst. And during the anointing service that evening, participants had the option to bring their scraps up and lay them on the ground 
in front of the stage area. So at the conclusion of the service, there was this beautiful multicolored collage of cloth laid up at the front, a mosaic of all the scraps that people had laid down before God. When I was thinking of a sermon title for this Sunday, and I was thinking about mosaic, I wanted to check the definition just to make sure it was fitting. And it is a design using smaller pieces to make a bigger picture. There's a whole sermon in that as well about all of us being the mosaic of God's church. But the internet also provided me with another definition that I had not been expecting. Mosaic of or pertaining to Moses. So mosaic with a double meaning. Mosaic made up of all the broken pieces of ourselves that Jesus helps us to carry. And Jesus himself as mosaic of Moses. We read in Acts 3.22, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your people. You must listen to everything he tells you. So let's listen to those words of Jesus again. Come to me, all you who are exhausted and weighted down beneath your burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the second picture of the series, the ox herder sees footprints. He's reached the point where he's decided he does need something more in his life, and he's investigating what that missing something could be. However, this stage is mostly reliant on listening to and reading about what other people are doing, other people's spiritual journeys and what worked for them, rather than exploring the personal call. In the third picture, the ox herder actually finds the ox. This is a stage where you begin to actually try the practices that you've learned about. You start reading devotionals regularly, or doing yoga every morning, or meeting with a wise mentor, and you are filled with anticipation. The fourth picture is the ox herder attempting to catch the ox. This represents the difficulty of maintaining those spiritual practices over time, staying consistent when life gets in the way, or stress and doubt overtake us. School just started, so it seems fitting to do an object lesson. When I attended the annual conference equipping session on resiliency, one of the pieces of advice that the presenter gave us was, you cannot give from an empty cup. Imagine that you are a cup waiting to be filled, and what fills you are the things that give you life. So it might be taking a walk in the forest in silence, just taking in the sounds of the creatures and the intricacy of the plants and the freshness of the air. It might be treating yourself at your favorite coffee or tea shop. It might be taking the time to pray. It might be receiving a compliment for something that you have been working hard on. Or sitting down to read a new book that you've been wanting to read. It could be going out on a fishing trip or taking the time to sit and play a game with your family or playing with your dog or your cat or reading the Bible. You might be taking a nap. or baking just for fun. I mentioned last week that playing chimes is one of mine. So each time you find a chance to do one of these activities that feeds your soul, 
you're building up resiliency. Every time putting something back into your cup. And every time that you do one of these things, you're less likely to break or to react negatively if something terrible happens. You're more likely to remain calm, stay positive in situations because your cup is full. And that's one good reason to make sure that you're doing things to fill your cup. But Jesus says, love your neighbors as you love yourself. So when we find ourselves grateful for our own lives, we want to help others in need. We want to give back to our neighbors. We want to offer to do the dishes or cook dinner or walk the dog when our spouse is feeling too tired to do it that day. We want to volunteer when people are in need of something in our area of expertise. We want to drive people where they need to go when they aren't able to take themselves. We want to protect people who seem unable to defend themselves. We want to be there for someone who has no one else but us. And these are all examples of good neighbor care. And they all involve us giving of ourselves and taking from our metaphorical cup. Which is fine, unless all we're doing is giving to others and not taking time to do those things that fill our own souls and build back up our resiliency. Because once we have an empty cup, we're still trying to give to others. We're not giving our best anymore. We're giving, but we are exhausted. So we screw up, and we can do more harm than good. Or we have short fuses, so we end up taking our irritation out on those we're trying to help. Or we're emotionally frayed, so we end up taking the pain of those we're helping and feeling it as our own to the point where we're just as in need of help as those we're trying to save. So what does that mean? Well, for one, it means that when we have given until our cups are empty and keep trying to give out of empty cups because it just doesn't seem like there's any other way, we can give our pain to Jesus to hold. Jesus is carrying our burdens with us so that when we need to, we can take a deep breath and calm down. Jesus is carrying our burdens with us so we can take that second to appreciate the beauty of the flower we always pass in the yard. Jesus is carrying our burdens with us, so when we need to take the time to do something that refills our cups, Jesus will continue to hold those we are trying to help until we are ready to help them again. Jesus is carrying our burdens with us so we can steady and center ourselves to do good work in the world. Next slide, please. The fifth picture is the ox herder tending the ox. If we persevere in our spiritual practices and self-care, they will grow easier for us to fit into our lives. If you read the Bible every day, if you pray at each meal, if you thank God upon waking every morning, those practices will become more natural each time. Next slide. The sixth picture shows the ox herder riding the ox. Martine Batchelor, a former nun who has studied in the Korean Zen tradition, describes this picture best when she writes, as we accept ourselves in the world, our potential unfolds. Fears and insecurities dissolve, and we can express ourselves through music, painting, poetry, cooking, gardening, being with children or old people. Everything we do, everything we do becomes an art. The seventh picture shows just the ox herder resting alone. This is the point where being aware of our needs and using everyday activities as spiritual practices has become natural for us to the point where we don't even need to think about it anymore. You might say at that point we are living our best lives. The eighth picture has neither the ox herder nor the ox. In Buddhist practice, this depicts emptiness, a letting go of self. 
One way you could think about this would be the realization that there is so much beyond yourself. So you may be living your best life, but there is a world beyond you, and worlds beyond that. And it is all part of something so much bigger and more awe-inspiring than we can even imagine. The second to last picture shows a return to the original place depicted in the first picture. Thinking only of all that is beyond you can lead to you feeling very insignificant or like life does not matter, when in fact you're called to look at your life from before with new eyes. Seeing everything that felt like not enough before as connected to a measurable value of the greater picture. What was missing all along was perspective, the ability to see the things in your life as interconnected and precious, practicing gratitude. And the final picture shows a man entering a marketplace, carrying a large sack. The final step for us could be living like Jesus, loving neighbor as ourselves, helping expecting nothing in return, acting with wisdom and compassion, understanding there is a force beyond us all that connects everyone together in common humanity. The caption reads, Ragged and barefoot, you approach the market and the streets. Even covered in dust, why would the laughter cease? The bees and butterflies are happy because... Flowers have bloomed on a withered tree. Please pray with me. Lord, we have laid down our brokenness before you. We have placed our trust in you. Open our eyes to awareness of your presence moving in our lives, healing and renewing, calming and encouraging. We pray that flowers may bloom on the withered places of our hearts and that we may feel the weight of our burdens lightened through the knowledge that Jesus carries our pain with us. Always. Amen. For the benediction, please join me in reading number 764 in the Blue Hymn Note. Go in love. Go in peace. Go in safety. Amen.